Hello, everyone. Welcome to day one of Schoology's Elite Assessment Bootcamp. My name is Kelly Aidey. I'm the Director of Instructional Strategy here at Schoology. And it's April, meaning that it is assessment season. So this is the perfect time for us to explore assessment strategy, creation, analysis, kind of like, I guess it's like assessment literacy week. So uh, we create assessment bootcamp. We've got five days of webinars to cover everything you need to get started with planning, building, managing, and measuring the effectiveness of assessments. Uh, hopefully by the end of this week, uh, you'll have a perspective about best practices needed to become more successful as you tackle uh, this really important topic uh, of assessments. Uh, when we actually look at this week, here's what we've got coming. Today is kind of Assessments 101. Uh, so we're going to talk about different types of assessments and how they should be used. Uh, day two is going to be the, talking about how do you build that balanced assessment kind of approach within your school or district. Um, day three will be uh, talking about managing assessments. Day four is uh, measuring student data. Uh, in, especially in, in the perspective of continuous improvement. And then day five will be kind of a deep dive and step-by-step -step walkthrough uh, of school assessment management platform. So hopefully everyone uh, is able to see the screen. Uh, just kind of as a, a quick reminder for those of you that maybe haven't been part of one of our webinars before, you should see a window that allows you to post questions um, or post something into kind of the chat area. Uh, we have people monitoring that area and we'll be responding um, as we can throughout the session today. We'll also be posting some resources over uh, in that same area for you to grab as we continue on uh, through today. So, but let's start talking um, about Assessments 101. Uh, what are assessments and how should they be used? Uh, before we actually get into some of the content today though, we want to actually ask um, our folks in the room, so to speak, um, what exactly are you using in terms of assessment tools uh, inside of Schoology? So we'll give everyone just a minute or two to respond uh, to what you're using and then we'll share those results. All right, we're up to uh, almost 75%. Keep those votes coming in. All right, let's take a look. And interestingly, and this is actually not a surprise, we have most people uh, that are looking, uh, mostly using test quiz. We have some who have started using uh, course assessments. That's the uh, kind of the new uh, assessments tool that got enabled in materials earlier this year. We've got some folks using AMP and we have, um, you know, that whole, uh, we're not really doing anything yet with assessments. Um, I think that for the most part, assessments are an incredibly powerful part of what you can do inside of Schoology. And so we're really happy to have everyone here today. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and hide that. And um, I want to actually um, welcome uh, our other person today who is joining me, uh, and that is Lisa Bona. Um, so as I mentioned, I am Kelly Aidy. I'm the Director of Instructional Strategy. Um, but I'm also joined today by Lisa Bona. Um, she's actually the Manager of Professional Development here at Schoology, but she's got a pretty deep background in the assessment space. So I'm going to give Lisa just a second to introduce herself. Hi, as Kelly said, I am Lisa Bona. Um, I came to Schoology from a company we all know called Scantron, um, where I worked for just shy of 18 years. Um, I spent the first 10 and a half in assessment development, design, item writing, and creation writing assessments, not just for Scantron, but also for our clients. And then um, the last about eight years, I spent in professional development at um, Scantron 
teaching our customers how to design their own assessments and talking about the statistics you can get from assessments and what you can do with that data to help students in the classroom. One of the most important things about having you on today, Lisa, is uh, I just was reading an article in Ed Leadership. They had a whole um, issue that was devoted to assessments. And one of the points that was made actually by Thomas Guskey was that there's very little depth uh, PD, I guess I'd call it, around building actual quality assessments. There's PD around formative versus summative, but pe people don't always get the the training on, but what does it take to actually like have an assessment plan and plan for quality assessment? So is that part of what you did when you were with Scantron? It is part of what I did. We designed blueprints. We talked about what is your purpose for the assessment? Um, how deep are you assessing? Um, what are you going to do with the data so that we made sure we wrote an assessment that worked for their needs. Okay, great. So, so you're the perfect guest <laughs> to have <laughs> on our to have on our show today. All right, great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of jump into the agenda today. Um, again, we're going to be talking about kind of the types of assessments that we have, what an assessment really is, and then planning for quality assessments. So today is really going to lay the foundation for the rest of this week. Uh, which is really around, you know, how do you then like build that quality assessment? We'll talk about that a little bit more tomorrow. Um, how do you then manage them? How do you measure them? And then what does it look like when you've got like a, an all-in-one solution uh, that can help you with all those pieces? Uh, we'll also have a little bit of uh, takeaway stuff uh, at the end, and then we'll leave some time for Q&A. But as I said, if there are questions that surface uh, throughout today, uh, absolutely put them into the chat area. And, um, you know, we'll try to get to as many as we can. All right, I'm going to go ahead and hide uh, my screen so we can uh, take a look at the rest of the slide deck today. Um, and again, Lisa, I just want to thank you uh, for joining us today. I think it's going to be awesome to have you uh, as part of uh, the whole kind of program we've got going on. Okay. So assessments 101, what is an assessment? Um, I've got two different definitions here. Uh, one of them from, uh, actually from that Ed Leadership issue I mentioned earlier from February. Uh, this, I kind of like this definition that assessment is a process uh, by which we make inferences about what students know, understand, and can do. I think one of the most important parts of that particular uh, definition is that comment about, or that area about uh, inference. So, you know, when you think about what students know, one of the things we can never do is actually peek inside their actual brain, at least not yet, to find out what they know. So we have to do and design things to help give us understanding about where their understanding is. If we look at Rick Stiggins, who you, we can't talk about assessment without talking about Rick Stiggins, in my opinion. Uh, and I pulled this right out of the Perfect Assessments Perfect Assessment System, uh, which is a text that he's got out there that would be a great resource. If you haven't picked it up, I'd highly recommend it. Uh, but he defines it as the process of gathering evidence of student achievement to inform instructional decisions. So in both cases, they're talking about assessments as a process. And I think that's what I wanted to underscore today is that sometimes we think about assessments as a noun um, in terms of the, the thing that it is. And really the thing is actually the whole process of gathering evidence, not the single item. So I want to lean heavily on Simon Sinek for a minute, um, because before you start thinking about what an assessment is, what the types are, you really need to start with why. And if you've seen the Start With Why TED Talk or you've read Simon Sinek's book, you'll know that he talks about communicating things um, from the inside out. So starting with why, moving to how, and then out to what. And what he points out in the TED Talk is that we often communicate in the opposite direction, that we start with why, go to how, or start with what, go to how, and then end with why, when we should reverse that, that kind of progression of communication. And what struck me about that when I saw that first, and this was years ago that I saw that TED Talk, was that we should really think about starting with why with instruction and thinking about the purpose for what we're doing and then communicating that well. Um, and sometimes I think we don't always tell students what they should expect uh, when we're doing assessments, why we're giving it, why we're giving them the items we are, what we expect to gain, what they should see uh, from it. And that's something that um, I think that Stiggins has been particularly passionate about is also involving students in that assessment process. But when you think about the why, um, in terms of the purpose, and everything should start with purpose with assessment, 
we've got two of them, some of them informative, uh, as I think everyone probably knows. So the question really is, when you start with why, is the assessment designed to support learning or is it designed to evaluate learning? So if, because depending on where you go with either of those two questions, it will take you in a different direction in terms of the how and the what. If we think about the how, when we think about whether or not we're supporting learning, so that's happening in the learning process or evaluating it at the end, we need to ask ourselves, what are the best methods to gather that evidence? And chances are good that it's not gonna be a single method. And in fact, it shouldn't. If it's a process, then we need to think about multiple ways to gather that evidence. And when we think about the what, what learning targets will this address? And I think that, you know, for a long time, learning targets were, you know, kind of a, an overarching idea, uh, especially when we look at like state testing, they often gave us kind of domain knowledge. But when we're talking about, you know, whether or not we're gonna support learning, we need to be very specific and targeted about the, the discrete things we wanna see students able to do. If we're talking about evaluating learning at the end, that might be more of an umbrella type of, of standard where we wanna see kind of in general where students fell. So as we think about assessments, even this week, uh, we really wanna make sure that we do start with that why. All right, so different types of assessments. Um, formative and summative are ones that we've talked about before. Um, I'm gonna throw benchmark and interim assessments in here as well because those also play a role, especially as, as we think about a balanced assessment system. Uh, and I used a uh, medical kind of analogy or metaphor here. Um, so when you think about having a, let's say you've got a, a fitness goal or a health goal, we've got a lot of things that would fit maybe more into a formative kind of a tool. So you might have a, a blood pressure monitor, you might have a Fitbit or, or an Apple Watch or a Garmin. Um, you might be using, you know, measuring tape if you're trying to, to lose weight and you're trying to track, you know, if you're actually losing inches uh, where you want to lose them. The scale, uh, another one. All those are kind of formative because they help you make a correction immediately. So the whole goal behind those kinds of tools are to look at what's happening right this minute and then what can I do tomorrow or even for the rest of the day to help change that. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, skipping over benchmark for a moment, we've got summative assessments. And I know this is morbid, um, but I'm not the first one to come up with this. And I don't know who first said this, but a summative assessment is often like an autopsy. Um, so I have the CSI image there because um, it's evaluating something that something's already happened. We're going to go back and take a look and see what, you know, what evidence we have for what happened before, but nothing really changes after that necessarily. It's not, I mean, not in terms of learning. Uh, it's not designed to like change learning the next day. It's kind of designed to see if learning actually occurred uh, that was expected. Now in the middle, we've got those benchmark and interim assessments. If you think about going in for your annual checkup, you might schedule those and it, it's maybe not even related to your other fitness goals. So you may have like a six week diet plan that you're doing. Um, and you have your, uh, your physical, but those two things maybe don't correlate in terms of time. So for benchmark and interim assessments, those happen at fixed points, you know, within, let's say, a school year, but that doesn't mean they're necessarily tied into a specific end of unit. Uh, it's often tied to just like a certain marking point. So it might be at the end of a trimester. You might be in the middle of a unit at the end of that trimester, uh, but you're still going to give that, that benchmark or interim assessment. So um, this is just kind of some, some major bullets. Uh, when we think about the what and we think about uh, how we distinguish between these, there's two major things that really distinguish our types of assessments, when it occurs and that ever present and ever important why. So when uh, formative assessments, as we all know, those actually are designed to impact instruction during learning, where summative assessments actually uh, tend to be given at the end of a learning episode uh, to measure or evaluate the learning that happened. Um, the biggest thing to think about though is that why, and that's why I've got it bolded on this particular slide. So we, if we wanna make adjustments to learning, we wanna encourage ongoing growth, we wanna provide feedback, we wanna support learning, we want students to be involved in exactly where they're headed, where they are now, and how they can close that gap, that falls into that formative assessment range. If you are simply trying to see where students are against standards that you know they need to master by the end of, let's say, a school year, 
then that's why you might give an interim or a benchmark. That may impact learning, it may not. So that can be kind of formative or summative depending on how it's used. And then a summative assessment, the why typically is about uh, documenting learning, accountability, evaluating a program. Uh, and I think one of the most important things that um, I've seen about thinking about different types of assessments is that what really determines the type of assessment is the why and how it's used. So you have things that can absolutely work as a summative assessment or things that can work as a formative. It depends on what you're really doing with those assessments that determines kind of which bucket that would fall into. And then I can't, uh, we can't really have a conversation about assessment practices without a word about common assessments. Uh, for a long time, teachers had to kind of work independently uh, in designing their own. And then, you know, with the really important work uh, from Rick DeFore about PLCs. When PLCs started really hitting the scene, you know, there's those three questions about what do I want students to know, how do they learned it, and what do we do if they haven't? And so this idea of common assessments, I think, really was a kind of a critical part of that work. So when we talk about common assessments here, if you think about course assessments, those are ones that live within the construct of a, of a single course or a section. Um, where common assessments are one that are given across multiple sections, across multiple buildings, across multiple districts even. Um, so when we talk about common assessments, we're talking about the same assessment that's given to multiple sections regardless uh, of teacher, um, where course assessments are really kind of teacher driven. Uh, something else to think about in terms of uh, what we think about with assessments is matching assessment methods, which is the how, in that start with why diagram. And then also thinking about what types of learning targets we're really dealing with. Um, and all of this came, it's been adapted from uh, the Stiglitz book I referenced earlier, the perfect assessment system. There's really only four different assessment methods. You've got selected response, you've got constructed response, you've got performance assessments, and you've got personal communication. And then on the other side of that, then, if you think about the types of learning uh, target types we have, again, that's a pretty limited number. There's really only four of them. If you have a learning target, it's going to fall under a bucket of either uh, content knowledge, uh, reasoning or problem solving, uh, something that's a performance skill, or something that, that really demands the, the creation of a product uh, or the development of a product. So when you think about your assessment methods and then the learning target types, you'll notice that some of these fit more cleanly than others under these different methods. So selected and constructed response I have in bold because those are actually some things we're gonna take a look at uh, in just a minute. Lisa's gonna walk through the differences between those and how those work inside of Schoology. Uh, performance assessments and personal communication You'll notice that those uh, can also um, hit different areas of those learning target types. But when you're thinking about your why, and then you need to think about the how, it really depends on also the what, so that you can pick the right how, if that makes sense. So also we need to think about our audience. So, and I stole this from The Matrix, one of my favorite movies ever. Uh, it's the question that drives us. And so we also need to think about who is gonna be consuming that information. If we're talking about a single assessment, and that's really what this double bubble map represents here. If you've got teachers or PLCs that are going to be looking at an assessment, they're gonna have a different set of questions that are driving uh, the, the kind of the, the how they will deal with the information um, versus maybe an administrator at the principal level, maybe a curriculum coordinator, maybe a data, maybe a, a data um, and assessment uh, director they have different questions that they're trying to answer. That's not to say that you can't have an assessment that does both, uh, but I think it's also important when you're thinking about uh, what assessments you wanna give and, and how you do those and when, you have to keep in mind the who. And so over on the teacher PLC side, you know, you're know, you really concerned about student progress. Um, what do I need to adjust in my teaching? Are we being consistent? Um, I've been part of some really powerful experiences with PLCs that were specifically working on writing and that norming process of are we really evaluating student writing the same way across the board or are we being inconsistent? Um, which students are having trouble? And if they missed a question or they're having difficulty with the standard, what tripped them up? What do I need to go back and explore? And also sometimes it comes down to, especially if it's a summative assessment, 
do we need to adjust the scores uh, to give kids kind of a, to acknowledge that maybe we need to throw something out or look at something differently in terms of how we weight it? If we look at the administrator and curriculum coordinator side of things, you know, that's often driven uh, in terms of looking at a program overall. Maybe not individual students, which is the concern of a teacher, but maybe groups of students. Or are we allocating resources to the right places to really impact learning? Do we need to adjust things in our curricular program? Uh, one thing that I think has been interesting, you know, being part of uh, a district that does do state testing, like all of them, um, you know, assessments start happening in March and April. Well, that's long before the school year is over. Um, and so in some cases, we had to adjust what we taught when just to make sure that we were aligned with the timing um, of that really kind of high stakes assessment that happened for us at a state level. In the middle, we've got things that are common. Um, we, everyone wants to see if we're, if we're seeing growth over time. Um, is this a prediction of what future scores might be? Are, are we teaching the standards the way we should be? Are there problem questions? How did students do overall? So those things in the middle kind of, I think, bridge the gap there between two sides. But don't forget to, to enter the who into the, in the equation when you're thinking about an assessment plan. Uh, and then the other thing that I want to think about with the who is that shift that we've seen to collaborative assessments. Um, and this came out of uh, Larry Ainsworth's text on Common Formative Assessments 2.0. And this really struck me because I started teaching, I'm not going to say how long ago. Let's say it was in the 90s. Let's say the early 90s. Um, at that point, we really didn't have collaborative assessment teams, at least we didn't in my district. Um, and so the path you went down was you may or may not give a pretest, but you would teach, 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 and then give a test. Um, you might have a quiz in the middle where you'd give students a grade um, just so they kind of would see how they were doing on the way. But it wasn't part necessarily of a real, I don't think, solid instructional design. And we started to see that shift to you know, collaborative assessments when we started seeing more of PLCs doing common work together. But when we think about when you start aligning uh, standards and you start aligning um, your learning targets, now the process looks much different. So it might be you give a pre-assessment where you can then analyze what students know coming in, do some goal setting, and then notice teach and assess, teach and assess, teach and assess are all segmented by interpreting what's happening and making some adjustments before you move on. And also having a mid-unit team check in there um, before you give that post-assessment. So when we think about also building things in common, we also need to think about our timing of when we can meet together to really look at the data and then act on it. Um, back in the, in the day, you might give a quiz, but after that it was done. Uh, it wasn't part of, the, uh, of an idea of like students showing growth. And um, Stiggins made this comment about how, you know, we used to have kind of a punitive system in place where we made success a scarcity uh, because for a long time, assessments were designed to rank students and to put them into a, an order of who were the best achievers versus those that were not achieving. And our mission has changed that we now need to support all learners. So it's, it's not about giving them a, a specific ranking. Um, it's about providing them some supports as they grow and making assessments part of that process. So finally, um, as we talked about earlier, you know, not everybody gets uh, the foundations of assessment literacy, either in their in-service program, if they're, you know, starting to, to look at teaching as a career, um, or, or even maybe even at a, a PD level at the, at the district or building. So I think that people are, are well versed in the ideas of, of formative assessments and summative, but there are some really kind of critical components to actually, you know, building uh, an assessment and being very thoughtful about that. So, um, and this again is from Larry Ainsworth, um, the foundational steps of assessment literacy. And the very, very first step is know that purpose. So we get back to that start with why. You've got to know why you're assessing. Um, before you can decide that appropriate format, before you can select and create that assessment, before you can administer a score and analyze that, make your inference, and then make adjustments as needed. So again, it's very, very important that we know that purpose and we start with the why. And then finally, the last thing that I want to talk about before I pass it over to Lisa to talk about some, some of those kind of more nuanced things about question types and how do you think about those as we build um, you know, when ISTE revamped their standards for educators, uh, you know, they, they kind of uh, tweaked this one to, to now address this idea of being an analyst. And the educators need to understand and use data to drive their instruction and support students in achieving uh, those learning goals. So, you know, even in, in, in arenas like ISTE, 
that idea of assessment being really part, a critical part of the instructional process uh, is now even something that they have a focus on in terms of the ESD standards. All right, so that being said, you know, one thing that we want to talk about is now that we've talked about what different assessments are, whether it's formative, benchmark, or summative, and thinking about uh, kind of what, what methodology should go there, what learning targets we're addressing, um, Lisa is going to actually take us through what does it take to really plan uh, for that quality assessment. So um, I will turn it over to Lisa. Hi, I am back. Um, hopefully you all can hear me. And um, that plan for a quality assessment needs to happen whether you are looking at creating a common assessment, creating a summative assessment for your classroom, or even one of those formative tickets out the door, you still need to plan and think about why am I assessing and what is the best method for um, delivering that particular assessment. So Kelly, if you wanna go ahead and advance. There we go. This is an assessment blueprint. Um, you probably, hopefully, have seen uh, that your state assessment uh, has a blueprint. Uh, they will tell you this standard is going to be on this assessment. There are going to be this number of items or questions. Uh, they may not get into as much detail as um, we have here with telling you the types of questions that may be on the assessment for that particular standard. Um, or the cognitive complexity level, that DOK, that domain of knowledge. Um, but when you're writing your own assessment, or even if you're selecting items from an item bank that maybe came with um, a textbook or an item bank that you have access to, you really want to sit down and think about why am I assessing? What is it that I need to get out of this assessment? And then you need to break it down into the actual standards you're going to assess. Um, you can see this is a fourth grade number and operations assessment. Um, in my previous life, life, I had two focuses. I had math as a focus and I have language arts, English as a focus. And so all of my examples you're going to see are pretty much gonna fall in those two subject areas. But this particular one is math. Um, this would be more of a classroom ascent assessment, um, possibly more of a summative assessment because we are looking at all of the standards um, in the Common Core for fourth grade number and operations. But you can see each standard is listed. The number of questions we want on the assessment to represent that standard, that is incredibly important um, piece of information right there. If you put one question on to assess a standard, you don't have enough data to know whether your students uh, have mastered that standard, need help with the standard, you have one data point and that doesn't tell you anything, but they couldn't do that question or they could do that question. So as you can see, I have multiples of three and four. Um, so you really wanna look at writing three to four questions per standard on an assessment so that you, when you look at that data, you have enough data to make an inference about a student or even about a group of students as a whole. Uh, you just need enough data to make an informed decision. And I think that's one of the biggest pieces that the blueprint can help with is making sure you have enough data to make a decision about student learning. So you can see the next column is the question types. Um, so for those four items in the first row, we're going to have one fill in the blank drop down, one multiple choice, one fill in the blank text, and one constructed response. The next is the cognitive complexity. The multiple choice, the fill in the blank drop down, those are probably gonna fall in your domain of knowledge one. They're gonna be more recall, things the student should know. The fill in the blank text and the constructed response where the students are constructing the answer, they're gonna fall more in a two. Um, some of those, um, those constructed response can fall into a three 
um, domain of knowledge. You're really not going to get to a four unless you do a performance assessment, which is an entirely different kind of assessment. Um, but once you've outlined what it is that needs to be on this assessment, you can see, oh, wow, that's going to take me 32 questions in order to cover everything that I need to make sure I cover on this assessment. Um, and in those 32 questions, we're going to make sure we're writing exactly what we need or pulling exactly what we need so that students can show us what they know. Okay? And this is whether the assessment is formative or summative. Okay? You're going to want that. Even um, an interim benchmark, you need to know what's on this assessment and the information you're going to get out of it before you ever start writing or selecting items from a bank. Uh, the next thing we're gonna talk about is um, difficulty versus rigor. So Kelly, do you wanna advance me again? Uh, so you can see this um, matrix in here and there's the link, um, but this is a rigor matrix and it's talking about looking at are you making the assessment more rigorous? Are you asking students to do thinking skills that are more complex? Or are you just making your um, assessment more difficult? Uh, and there are ways of doing that. If you take a, um, if you take a mathematics example um, of finding the area of a figure, um, if I give kids or students whole numbers um, to find the area, that's less difficult. If I give them fractions or decimal numbers, that's more difficult, but not necessarily more accurate, more academically rigorous. If I ask them, if I give them the area and ask them to find either the length or the width, that's more academically rigorous, even if I'm still using whole numbers. So you have to think about, Am I just making it more difficult or am I adding rigor? If I'm adding rigor, then I'm moving along those DOK levels and asking students to do more and be more and more strategic and thinking about their learning rather than just making the test more difficult to pass. Um, which going back to as um, Kelly was saying, you know, it used to just be an assessment was a way to rank students. These are the smart students and these are the students that are not passing this material right now. Whereas now we want to look at, okay, students can find the area of a figure, but can they use that information to find a missing piece? Can they use that information to um, tell me what dimensions might work? And there are multiple answers. So that difficulty versus rigor becomes very important when you start writing assessments. All right, Kelly, we can advance again. All right, timeline. This is a big one. Um, remember, in my former life, I used to help districts write assessments. Um, if you are writing a common assessment, these take a long time. Um, this particular timeline example uh, assumes that you have one content person for like elementary ELA, and they're going to have to write three to four assessments, okay? So you wanna give them time. So they're gonna meet with their teams, they're going to create that blueprint, they're going to do all of that. That's gonna take probably a week. Okay, by the time they have a meeting, they create a blueprint, they check their blueprint, um, and they're ready to go, and they're writing multiple blueprints, okay? They need that time. Then they're going to need time to do item entry, test creation, all of that. If they're writing multiple assessments, it can take three to four days per assessment, so you need to plan two to three weeks for them to just get the assessment written. Then you have to review it. Okay. And it's not the person who wrote it who should be reviewing it. You should have a completely separate group of people reviewing the assessment when you're talking about a common assessment. So that you review it, you make any edits, then it should be reviewed again. Just because 
the first group said an item or question was okay doesn't mean that it really is. So you might catch something in round two that didn't get caught in round one. So you need weeks to do those reviews. And then once you've completed all of the reviews and your assessments are complete, then you have to figure out how am I delivering this assessment? If I'm using paper and pencil and I'm printing this, then I have to get all my copies printed, right? Maybe I have to send it to the print center at the district and get it all printed off. If I'm doing this assessment online, say through AMP, then I need to push those assessments out to all of those courses and, and get all of it ready to go so that finally, a couple days before I want to give the assessment, all work is complete. I shouldn't hopefully be doing any last second changes. Everything should be complete. And then we start our testing period, which opens up our test dates. So you notice here I have my test date as October 16th to 20th. We started thinking about this assessment back in August. So building those common assessments, you're not going to write the blueprint today and deliver a test next Monday. Uh, if you do that, you, you're opening yourself up to um, some inaccuracies getting into your data because you, you need that thinking time and that processing time and the time to create that established blueprint that's going to work your way through um, and give you that good base. It's the backbone of your assessments. So you really need that blueprint to be good. Now, next year, if you're going to write a similar assessment, you may only need to tweak the blueprint and your time may reduce because you might reuse items that you've created before, et cetera. So your time frame might reduce as you get more experience with writing them, but especially the first time, give yourself a good chunk of time before you want to deliver that assessment. Um, if you're talking about a course assessment, Kelly, you went too fast. Um, if you're talking about a course assessment, which is the bottom piece, you still want to create a blueprint, even if you're looking at a ticket out the door. Um, a ticket out the door, um, you still don't necessarily want to give them just one question to make they understood all of the material that happened in that last um, 45 minutes or hour and a half of assessment, however your um, classes are broken down. You still want to give them two, maybe three um, topics to write about or um, answer questions just so you can see the breadth of what they may have um, learned that day. If you're creating a classroom summative assessment, you still want to create that blueprint so you make sure, oh, I covered this standard pretty heavily, so I need to make sure I assess it with more questions. Um, that type of information. So it's still going to take you um, days to create and deliver that assessment. It's not going to take as long as a common assessment, but you still want to make sure you give yourself time to write a thorough, complete assessment that's going to give you the data you want so that you can make decisions about your students' learning and what maybe needs to be covered again um, and what you can move on from and build upon um, as you progress. Okay, Kelly. So kind of the two main item types that we're going to be talking about are the selected response questions um, that Kelly mentioned earlier and constructed response questions. Most assessments, unless they're performance-based assessments, fall, the items or questions fall in these two categories. They're either selected response where students are given a set of responses and they are asked to um, choose the correct response, response from that set of responses. Um, they're not constructing anything. They're not using their own words. Um, in selected response, the questions really just require that students can recognize the correct answer. Um, you can write them so that they give you more information than that, but many times students can eliminate um, and it kind of boils down to, I'm selecting the correct response from the responses available to me. Constructed response, they're more open-ended. Um, students are asked to actually apply the knowledge and skills and critical thinking that they have been doing in the class. Um, there's usually more than one way to correctly answer the question. 
um, and it does require students to construct their own answer or develop their own answer. So it's making them use the knowledge they've learned to, um, to show you what they know. Um, okay, Kelly. And so we're going to talk about some individual types of um, selected response and constructed response. So we look at selected response first. You can see I have up on the screen multiple choice, fill in the blank, drop down, true, false, um, fill in the blank, drag and drop. These all would be considered selected response items. Um, two of them, the fill in the blank ones, are actually um, technology enhanced because students are picking from a drop down menu. Um, they're picking from a selected list and dragging it into place. But really what they're doing is asking students to select a response from the possibilities that they're given. So they are selected response items. Some of their benefits, they are very easy to score. Um, if you're using online assessments, which you have to do for the um, fill in the blanks, um, it's going to score it for you, right? So you don't have to score. Um, they're very familiar to students. Students know how to how to do this. They know how to use these items. They'll work well for you on a benchmark assessment and a summative assessment. Um, the drawbacks is that they don't really show you what the student can't do. Um, they show you the student can't do this, but other than that, you don't know. So all they're showing is what that student can't do, not what the possibilities are for the student. Um, the way a constructed response item would. There are some um, selected response question types that will allow you to put in a distractor rationale, um, which would do something um, like, like on this change orange and green ball, um, maybe the one where the apostrophe is in the wrong spot, it will say um, the student is using a plural possessive rather than a possessive. It lets the instructor know what the student isn't understanding, so at least um, it's a little easier to interpret the student's results if you have that distractor rationale. If you don't, all you know is they really could not do that skill. Next. Some other types of um, selected response questions that are available um, in our assessments um, that are, again, easy to score, work well on benchmark and summative assessments. Um, they may not be as familiar to students. Um, there's still one correct answer, but some of these, it's a little bit easier to see what the students know because they are um, picking and choosing like the, the highlight hotspot they're asking um, to select all of the quadrilaterals. So if they don't get them all or if they're not sure what a quadrilateral is, you can see that um, there's ordering. Again, the st steps are given to them, but they have to put them in order. Um, the label image, they're actually asked to take the labels and put them on the image in the correct place. With the label image, you could have more labels than are needed um, so that students really do have to know where things go in order to do those. Again, they're still going to be considered selected response, but they might actually give you more information about what students know and can do simply because they're just different enough that um, they give you that little bit of more information. All right, Kelly. The next one we're going to talk about is constructed response questions. Um, constructed response questions, their benefits they allow students to actually show what they know and what they can do. They're still familiar to students. They work really well on benchmark assessments and formative assessments. So those formative assessments you're giving students in your classroom to um, get them to show you what they know and what they can do and what they've learned that day. Um, some of the constructive response um, possibilities, some of the question types, are fill in the blank text. When they're filling in a blank and they're typing in the text, they actually have to know how to spell it correctly. They have to um, put things in the correct places in order to get the answer correct. It's still going to score for you, which is a nice benefit of fill in the blank text. Um, but students are asked to show you more of what they know when they have to put the text in themselves. Short answer essay, 
Um, this is great, again, because once again, students have to actually do it. Um, you can see that short answer essay question asks them to write a sentence that shows that the ball belongs to Jane. They're not picking the correct word to show it. They're actually writing the entire sentence to show you they know how to show that it's Jane's ball. Um, the third one that's up there is a math short answer. This isn't going to be quite as familiar to students, um, just simply because they're asked to use the menus to select the pieces they need. It might need a little bit of instruction from the teacher to show them how to use those tools, but once they've used them, then it's pretty familiar. And again, they get to show you their entire thinking process as part of their answer. The drawbacks, most of them have to be hand scored. Someone has to score it. Another drawback is that they're more time consuming to administer. You have to give students more time when they are typing their answer in or entering their answer or handwriting it on the paper. Um, you have to give them more time to get their thought processes out there. So they're going to be hand scored and more time consuming for administration. So things to think about as you're building that test and kind of circling back to that blueprint, the selected response items, um, if they don't have to read a huge reading passage before they start, um, a selected response um, question can take approximately a minute to answer if they don't have to do a lot of reading to answer it. Constructed response items, depending upon how much text you want them to put into the answer choice, you need to figure five to 10 minutes. Um, if they're writing an essay, then you need to give them even longer than that. But part of the blueprint is making sure students can complete the assessment in the amount of time you're planning to give them to complete the assessment. So thinking about how long is it going to take students to answer these 32 questions that I'm asking them to answer. Okay. Um, the next one, there we go. Other constructed response type questions. Um, again, they allow students to show what they know and can do. Um, this one, they work really well on formative assessments. They can work well on um, benchmark assessments also. Um, some of the drawbacks, they definitely are not very familiar to students. They have to be hand scored. Um, and again, they're more time consuming. But this, um, the one with the light bulb and the switch, that is um, what we call a highlight image. And students can actually draw on an image. You could put up a blank image and have students um, maybe show you a representation of um, a mathematical problem or something scientific, like the, maybe they need to actually write out a chemical reaction for chemistry. Um, and you can actually have them do that um, by using a highlight image. Um, we have chart questions. So some of the chart questions, um, students are asked to kind of complete the chart. The chart can be partially constructed response, but some of it's selected response also because they're they're picking where the bars are stopping in this case, but um, the grid is kind of set up for them. So that was kind of in between, but it's showing you, can they read this table and turn it into an appropriate histogram? Um, so you've got a few constructed response questions, um, like the, the chart, it could actually be scored for you um, if you allow that. Otherwise, you know, students are going to be constructing a chart all on their own. Um, if you're doing paper pencil delivery um, of the assessments. Okay, Kelly. And I'm turning it back over to Kelly at this point. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> you're yeah, welcome. Actually, yeah, thanks for walking through all that. You know, when we did the poll earlier, you know, we had, and I'm guessing this is representational, more than 80% of people were using test quiz. We had just over 40% that were using course assessments, and that was a really nice way to progress through what the new question types have and where they fit in, especially when we think about that blueprint and which items we need to include and which, what are the drawbacks of those and what are the, of the bonuses. We did have somebody ask, like, is there any way that Schoology can auto-grade those constructive response types? 
you know, I think that it's good to have a mix of, you know, some of those question types that are auto scored and some that give the teacher real insight into what the student knows, understands and is able to do. So that leads us to just some formative tips in Schoology, I called it. We talked about formative versus summative assessments. Technically, if something's formative, it shouldn't count against the, the student's score. It might be graded in terms of giving feedback, but it's not gonna be something that has either a benefit to the grade or a penalty, because the point is to inform instruction. So in, in Schoology, some things to keep in mind, you can always make something have a zero factor, which means that when it's put into the grade book inside of Schoology, it basically has no weight at all in the grade. Uh, the student can see the feedback, can see the score, but it doesn't actually impact anything in terms of the, of the percentage or the overall grade. Um, you can also give zero point items. So you might have some, some questions on an assessment that you think really you want to see what students know and you don't want that to really count against them. You can just make that particular question worth zero points, even if there's a right or wrong answer attached to it, the student isn't therefore penalized. Um, rubric feedback. Um, you know, when we do rubric scores, one thing to think about is not only can you give uh, a score on the rubric, but you can also add feedback that actually gives the student more information about the score that they receive with that little comment bubble. So make sure you're taking advantage of the rubric, the rubric feedback uh, functionality we've got. Um, matching reporting, if you are aligning to those learning targets and standards, and I would say that's something that is pretty critical in terms of looking at alignment to um, our, our standards, our learning targets, to get real measurement there, you have to align those inside of Schoology with that alignment tool. And that matching report is a way for students to see how they're doing, and also a way for teachers to see how they're doing. Um, on all the things you assess. If assessment really is a process of gathering evidence, you might be gathering evidence via test quiz or course assessments, but you also might be gathering it via discussions or assignments. Um, there's a multitude of things that actually contribute to our understanding of student knowledge, um, and mass reporting helps put that together into one view that's super helpful. And then finally, you know, something that I think is interesting, and I read this in the Stiggins book, was how we have to somehow give feedback that doesn't make students feel like they're not going to be successful. And so if we shift from a numeric display of achievement to a text-based achievement display, um, that can be really helpful. So instead of seeing a 4321, you know, you can set up grading scales inside a Schoology that actually are representational of something like developing uh, or emerging or proficient. Uh, or in for our elementary students, I used one back in the day that was not yet, almost, and nailed it. Um, so something to give them something beyond kind of the, the 4, 3, 2, 1. All right, so um, moving along then um, to our takeaways for today. Um, a, know thy purpose. Uh, hopefully people got that today. Um, also aligning items to learning targets is incredibly important as we look at that body of evidence. Um, as Lisa mentioned, make sure you've got adequate numbers of items for adequate evidence. If you're giving a formative assessment, you're going to be giving fewer items. They're going to be very focused on certain skills or certain learning targets. If you're giving something summative, that's probably going to encompass much more and be representational about the kinds of learning targets that make up a larger standard. So make sure you think about how much you're devoting in terms of quantity. Um, have a mix of activity or question types. We have a lot we can do with Schoology, not just inside a test quiz and course assessments, but just in the platform itself. Um, gather as much evidence as you can to make that good inference. Um, have a good mix of levels of rigor. Um, and then finally, probably what people are, are most excited about, and we'll be uh, adding little tips throughout the day in terms of what's on the roadmap. But in terms of question types for course assessments and AMP, you can expect to see the ability to uh, upload audio or video files. Um, now that is for the 16 or 17, 18 school year, excuse me. Eventually though, there'll be the integration of that recording tool, which is what people who use test quiz now are used to seeing. So this is kind of an interim step so that people can actually upload um, audio, especially for kids of accommodations. Uh, also, we've gotten a lot of requests for the ability to put images inside of the response options, not just the question stem. So we'll be adding that image upload for responses and also uh, kind of making that resizing of images inside of course assessments, um, native inside of that building window. And those also you can expect uh, in the 17-18 school year. 
And then also something else that I think is pretty exciting is the ability to provide question specific tools in course assessments, meaning that right now you might say that kids can use a calculator for the entire assessment, but you may really only want the calculator available for one particular question, but hidden the rest of the time. That will give you the ability to, to decide that as a teacher. Uh, and again, that's something that uh, will be part of our roadmap for the 17-18 school year. And then we'll be adding other uh, things as we go along this week that you can expect to see in uh, course assessments and uh, also AMP if you're an AMP user. Um, one more critical thing to point out, because we have a lot of test quiz users that are part of our, our audience today. We will be giving a way to migrate that content into course assessments once we decide to sunset test quiz, but that will not happen. Um, like you will have the ability to utilize test quiz through the 18-19 school year. Um, so for those that are concerned about when that will happen, not only will we give you the tool, we're gonna give you plenty of time to actually uh, address that. All right, so we've been answering questions as they've come along. Um, you know, I think that, you know, we got questions about um, you know, whether or not we're going to, to have different features available. We'll be publishing that on the public roadmap. It's probably the best place to look for that kind of content. Um, and if there's a specific question we're gonna, that we need to follow up on, we can do that. Um, somebody just asked Susan, audio video file upload. It is on the roadmap for 17, 18 school year. Um, that's the, the most definitive time frame I can give you. Um, and we have other things that, of course, will be part of the 18, 19 school year. Um, that will be available, including the ability to see item level uh, information for course assessments. So I'm saying 17, 18, do I mean 18, 19? If I'm saying 17, 18, I mean this current school year. If I'm saying 18, 19, I'm meeting the next school year. So sorry if that, was, if that has been uh, confusing. Um, just as a reminder, we will be recording these sessions. And if you signed up, you will receive an email at the end of the week that will give you access to those. Um, we really want to thank you for your time. Um, don't forget, we've got the rest of the week coming up. Tomorrow, we're talking about balanced assessment systems, including the integration of third-party test banks. Um, managing assessments, we'll be hearing from uh, one of our partners, Respondus, to talk about how that works inside of the platform. Uh, day four is measuring student data. And then day five is seeing Schoology AMP. All right, everyone, we're at the top of the hour. Uh, thank you so much. Um, final question from Steve today. During the course of the week, how much of each day's content will require us to be AMP users? Like today, nothing was AMP specific. Um, it did, though, talk about course assessments. Um, so we will not be talking about test quiz. I would say day five, um, which is the deep dive of, of the assessment platform, will definitely be kind of a preview. So even if you're not an AMP user, you can see it. And maybe a little bit of both um, we talk about uh, managing and measuring. So it'll be kind of a nice broad picture of all the things you can do inside of Schoology. All right, everyone, happy Monday. Thanks for joining us. We hope to see you for uh, the rest of our uh, assessment boot camp week. Um, and have a great day. <laughs>